for the Logan district that has dreamed of becoming an engineer. This opportunity is going to be available here versus the loss of that opportunity if it's sent to the southern or far western end of the county. So it's the equal access, and it served us well in the past with our former career education center. And that has trans transformed. Those of you that have been in this system or have roots in this system years ago, you know that it started out as an accelerated learning center. And actually foreign language was one of the key components that was offered here. So it's morphed a different way. It's time for it to morph in the direction that the 21st century demands for our kids. It's also sitting in the hub of those connections. And probably the, the best way for me to talk about connections is the next slide. Christy? We've talked about non-negotiables. Actually, we've talked about non-negotiables in the first meeting. That whatever the plans that were finalized, they must include this. Number one, they must integrate those four concepts across all areas of the curriculum. So we're not just leaving science or mathematics to be taken care of in your physics class or your calculus class. Those concepts have to be integrated into areas of language arts, into areas of social studies, across all aspects, including the arts, included in the areas of physical education and health. That was a non-negotiable. Number two, and remember I talked about the center, the hub, at our location. Here, we are within a fairly easy connection to UNC Asheville, to AB Tech. There are branches now of Lenore Ryan College here. There are branches of Western Carolina University here because the college and university connections are an absolute key. In other words, when a student enters into this high school, these have to be in place. There have to be opportunities for them through this STEM high school to attain college credit. Isn't interesting that the state, when they looked at the community college system, and that consortium to allow high school students to get credits. Remember what happened with the budget? We had over 1,300 students enrolled in courses at AB Tech who were picking up credits in many different disciplines. Because of the funding, those were, great, those were drastically reduced. But what was left? What particular areas did the state think was the most important to continue that connection for credits? STEM courses. We are extremely fortunate in the strong connection that we have already developed with a number of our post-secondary institutions, especially AB Tech Community College. That's a non-negotiable. This particular site allows that connection. Career apprenticeships and internships. Remember I talked about the broad representation on this planning committee. We had a number of individuals that represented various businesses, professional organizations. There's a reason. This is a win-win for them. In fact, one of the strongest proponents in Western North Carolina for STEM education is Advantage West, which represents the business interest here in Western North Carolina. When you look again at the pamphlet you have in front of you and you see who is represented in terms of the workplace here in Western North Carolina, you can see the fit. Again, we sit in the hub where we have incredible access to a number of these type of organizations. Our dream is for any student that walks in this door that chooses to be a student at this STEM high school, that we guarantee them up front, 
you're going to have an internship, apprenticeship, you're going to have summer work experience. We're going to make those connections, and we're going to make them in partnership with people like Tupelo Honey, with people like the Billboard Company, with people like Grove Park, with people like Advanced Technology in downtown Asheville. We're going to make those type of connections. Uh, it's interesting to hear again what is being discussed at the Chamber. Uh, the Chamber is moving in the direction of doing exactly that, strengthening the connections for opportunities, job shadowing for our students in both the Buncombe County National City School System. So again, there's a reason for that representation. Technology, uh, this has to be high tech. And the reason it has to be high tech is because the professions demand it. When you look at STEM related careers, technology is at the core. So as Tim talks to you about the facility, again, envision that we have to meet the technology needs. Our vision would be to coordinate again with those resources out in our community. So when a freshman enters into this particular high school, there's an opportunity for a one-to-one -one initiative when they walk in the door. And that piece of technology stays with them all four years in this particular high school. And then the non-negotiable is the expanded stakeholder input. And as I've said before, that clearly our intent. We see a green light in terms of a nod here from the board. You know, our mission is to take this on a road show out into each and every community to make sure we're educating our parents and our students about what we clearly see now in the crystal ball in terms of the need for STEM initiatives. Now, I also want to address again regarding the site. It's important, and again, Tim will talk with you regarding the funding, capital funding for this. Um, when we renovate, renovate this facility, uh, we're going to renovate, we're going to do it right, and it's going to be 21st century quality for our classrooms. The advantage from a financial standpoint in one location is, I think, considerable versus looking at the multiple programs that Chris is going to talk with you about that you're going to see that this facility would house when you start separating them and moving them out into the various areas of our county, you have to multiply the financial costs that come along with that. Because these particular areas of instruction, again, high tech, is going to require renovations to accommodate what those classrooms will need to look like. And in this central location, we maximize, I believe, those financial resources. Now, I do want to reference, before I turn this over to Christy, um, I know at our last STEM meeting, that, um, and, and Ms. Baldwin, I hope you don't mind I, I use your name, because Ms. Baldwin is a valued member of our planning committee. But she expressed a concern regarding uh, the environment, the site, particular site. So I think it's very important that I give you as an entire board the facts regarding this. And I'm going to say, first of all, three points I think that you need to hear. Number one, regarding this campus, the campus we are currently on, number one, we do not know if we have a problem. First, number one. Number two, more extensive testing is going to be determined, will be done to determine if we have a problem over the next several weeks. So we're going to take any concern seriously because safety in this school system is always a problem. But number three, even if we have a problem specific to the 
environment. The good news is that first, we are not or have not been on well water. And second, if an air quality or some type of vapor intrusion problem exists, it can be mitigated. We've spoken with multiple, multiple experts in the field that it can be mitigated to create a safe environment. That would simply become part of what this renovation process is. But first and foremost, we don't know if we have a problem, but we're going to make sure by further testing. Now, I say that because I need to give you background. I need to give you some history with this because it's an important concern. First, you may or may not know that Buncombe County Schools purchased the property that we're on, and it's important that you remember the address of that. It's 175 Bain Road that was purchased in 1989. At that time, we did two phases of an environmental study. The result of those two phases was that they did identify close to the road above the maintenance area they found an underground storage tank, it was back in 89, that was connected by pipe across the street to what is the address is currently 128 Bing Road. At the time, that was the active square D plant site. That was identified as toxic and it was removed. This was back in 89. They have all had documentation on this and we've had our attorneys go through the documentation along with us. But that was addressed in 1989. In the mid-90s, both the former Square D Plant 1, and that again, that's on 128 Bingham Road, and the former Champion Finishing Plant, that's right beside them, again across the road from us, on 200 Bingham Road. They were identified by the state, North Carolina Dena, as inactive hazardous site. That's the term that they use, inactive hazardous site. And that was based upon what they determined to be groundwater contamination. In fact, I spoke with a uh, Square D official last night that talked about, again, at that particular time, there was excavating that was being done across the road on that particular site. A large number, again, mid-90s, a large number of monitoring wells were dug on both sites. And in fact, if you look inside, I, I mean, I've included a, a sort of a site map, and a little hard to read, but what I want you to identify but first I'll find Bingham Road, and then you will see the markings for the central office and where a maintenance building now rests. And in 1995, three wells, and their label is MW15. If you look on our property, you'll see them just barely off of Bingham Road. And if you wanted to even a further visual of that, if you drive out the back entrance of our facility, those wells would actually be just adjacent to the intersection of our road leading out onto Bingham, right there at the gate. So that's where. Like a metal plate on the ground there, or pipes Right, two, two yellow pipes, and they're marked. Yeah, they're like uh, a couple of feet out of the ground, I think. That's correct. Yeah. Can I just clarify uh, something that you said? Uh, you said that the tank was toxic that was removed. What was, the, what was in the tank that was toxic? There was residue water that uh, was coming actually from a plant across the street. Was it square D or was it square D? It was square D. It was square D, and that was removed. I have Mike Wallach, who is uh, our health and safety coordinator, Mike.
comes from this background. He's very well versed in, in, uh, in environmental uh, concerns. Mike, do you want to can you answer that for us, please? Well, uh, I did not see the, the records on that on that UST. Uh, I, I believe it was an old uh, heat and oil number two heat and oil tank, and all that remained was was water at the time of the I, I never did get to see the final report on that. So. That was part of that phase study, and again, we have that we have that documentation. That's, that was that was well before. Yeah, my right. Time. Yeah. I have one other I'd like to clarify. Um, when Buncombe County purchased the property for the central office, uh, did they know about this hazard at the time, or did that happen after the purchase? The issue was Square D and Champion, which I'm going to get to just in a few seconds. Uh, we weren't aware of that. And, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a day issue. Again, realize the purchase was property in 89. There was an effort for environmental study, actually two phases of that. Um, again, in 1995, three wells were dug, um, three monitoring wells, and you see those cited. There's actually a fourth one that's labeled as MW20 that was dug as well in 1995, just adjacent to where the new maintenance building was placed. And that's the most important well from our standpoint. Uh, because the documentation that we have and we've received from Dino is that when it was dug in 1995, uh, there was testing that took place regarding that well. And we do know that that particular well, again, the one closest to maintenance, closest to our facility, it had lab results that came back as ND. And that ND meant non-detect, no contaminants were de detected. Now, we're not aware, of course, Dana, that the well was ever tested again. And in fact, remember at the time, there was no maintenance building. That maintenance building was actually built back in 2005. In 06, we know that there was asphalt and paving done for the road, and it covered that particular well. That well, again, MW20, was actually uh, the responsibility of Champion, because again, what happened in the mid-90s was both Square D and Champion were identified as NC Dino as sites of concern and they were required to mitigate. So I think it's very important as you look at that map, you know, you, you, I want you to, to notice and note the number of monitoring wells on both the former Square D site and the former Champion site. They still remain. There was a considerable amount of mitigation that was required state at that time. Again, this is across the road and the addresses, 128 Bingham Road and 200 Bingham Road across across the road from where our current campus lies at our property. Uh, well, and just for, for clarification, because uh, I know this is being recorded just so that there's no description. MW20 that you're referencing, I think is actually MW200. I think it's 20D. I think that last one was D. D. Yeah. Yeah. These things are hard. Right. 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 Wow. It's wow. difficult to see. Okay, so that's 20D. That's wow. right. Uh, might also want to make the note that in April of 2005, 2005 is when our construction began again regarding our maintenance building, but it was also when Square D sold that property at 128 Bingham, and they sold it to the ASC Business Park. Now, some might be interested in knowing that the ACS Business Park hosts the Federal Census Bureau. It's one of the, one of the organizations our construction of new classrooms 
on 128 Bingham Road. And again, 128 Bingham Road is the former Square D plant site. Um, and according to the letter, and, and I don't know how the confusion came about, but there was a call, didn't specify, but there was a call from a school board member, and from that, there was some type of, of um, insinuation that we were building classrooms across the street. So in March, we actually asked NC Diener just to come on site. So they, we walked the property, we made sure that, that there was clear clarification that no, we're on 175 Bingham Road. That's where our, our campus is located. That's where our central office is located. And we do not have plans to put classrooms 128. Uh, we certainly don't want to interrupt the routine of the Census Bureau. So and we made sure that there was clarification to that. Now since that time, since that particular meeting, we have worked uh, very closely with representatives from NC Diener. And I also want to uh, say that Square D has Square D maintains responsibility as well as the Champion Finishing Company, even though they have sold those properties. They still have responsibility for maintaining uh, safety uh, for adjacent properties. So they have come to the table, they're working with Dina, and we're looking at providing current testing make sure that it's specific to our campus and what we're talking about with renovation. And within the next several weeks, um, Square D has gotten legal for me, and I, Chris tried to explain this to me, uh, but Champion had the primary responsibility, so they had to release that responsibility to Square D, I think, to step <coughs> in and actually test that particular well. And in addition, again, as a, as a safety precaution, uh, what they're proposing for our conversation last night, Mike, with uh, Square D, is actually drilling an additional monitoring well to make sure that we have
Marshall became, I mean, Marshall was aware of that as part of what happened with the ex excavation. And as a result, that's what sort of moved into the two phases of environmental study to make sure that, that the site was clean. That was back in, again, back in 89. And the uh, monitoring wells on our property, the three monitoring wells that are, on, that are on our property, two by the road, one near the maintenance department, are, uh, they were put in place when? Those were placed we, in, in the mid-90s, to the best of, of our knowledge. That's what we've heard from Square D. And how often, by whom, and how often are they checked? There is monitoring that's been done. We know uh, annually over the past 14 years, we've seen documentation of that. Uh, so now, now how, how many of those wells, I can't. No, I'm talking about the ones on our site. The uh, ones on our site. Right. I understand that, that those have been tested over a uh, mic. Maybe you can help me with that. Yeah, I, I, I guess I can, Dr. Bowen. Where, where it gets a little complicated is Champion Finishing installed wells. They have an environmental Mike, consultant. Mike, can you go up to the mic? Well, here, so. Mike, that Champion Finishing. Monitoring wells that that they own, that their wells installed by their consultant, and Square D did the same. They, they did it on each other's properties, on their own properties, and the map you're looking at, MW20D. The reason we're having a hard time <coughs> collecting a sample permit because we're working with Square D on this project. MW20D is a champion-owned well. And that's why we had to go through attorneys and everything to get permission to sample that well. The, the cluster there of MW15 uh, wells, those are square D wells. So square D's been sampling those on a regular, in, regular basis. I don't know what that interval is. But we ha I haven't seen any of that information. So to answer your question, we, we have wells on our property from Champion and Square D wells. There are. They were sampled by, by Square D and Diener May 30th of this year. And did they check? They, they, they did have concentrations in them. I don't have that. That was my down in front of me. I had it. So 20 was never, hasn't been tested. It's not been tested. It's not that it hasn't been tested yet. It was tested once when it was installed in 2005. It came up. 1995, sorry, it came up on the tank. Mike, explain regarding the, uh, the distance, the monitoring wells, the distance from the facility, because that's very important too. It sure is. Um, the whole vapor intrusion process now, it, it, it's a new process. It was developed by EPA and it's uh, just filtered down the deaner on the state level. And uh, what they have determined is they need data from monitoring wells within, actually with uh, vapor extraction wells within 100 feet of your buildings. Uh, we don't even have monitoring wells. You see, these, these MWs, they're not vapor extraction wells. I believe there's vapor extraction wells on the old square D side, but they in no way affect us. So the process being, uh, next Wednesday, we're scheduled <coughs> with square D, uh, and then with square D's environmental consultant, they're gonna uncover MW20D and install another monitoring well closer to the building. And all you get there is you, you get groundwater results, and, and then you go into another process to determine where your vapor extraction well needs to be installed within 100 feet of the building. So it, this is going it, to—it's going to—it's a process involved with this. You don't just uh, okay. So within 100 or outside? Within 100 feet of the building, right? Mm -hmm. Determine if you're above these VI uh, concentrations. Uh, they, I have a question. Yes. Um, Are these well 
wells, do they also function uh, as far as cleaning existing water that's in there? Is they are collecting water out of those wells, but they are. There's an active pump and treat system on the Square D property. It's been, it's been going on since the 90s, mid 90s. Uh, can I also mention uh, Ms. DiCarlo from uh, the Department of Environmental and Natural Resources forwarded the test results to me. And uh, there's 73 pages because there's so many wells. I haven't gotten to the end of it, but um, Moxon Well 15 has 287 parts per billion of TCE. The safe level is five. This is just floors me. This is the worst well I've seen so far in 73 pages. And that's the one you said is on our property. MW15 is on our property. Did you say that you have results for all of them? All of I do. Okay. Well, except the ones we haven't tested. I just uh, had asked her to, to send me that. And, and but what she you're got saying it. is that our well is the highest of any of these wells? That I've looked at so far. Which ones have you looked at? How many have you looked at? Um, unless I don't look at home. I'd say I've looked at over half of them. Well, so I don't know about the rest. So do you understand what that means? 287 parts per billion of, of TC, TCE. In a groundwater. Exactly. It's in the we, water. We're not drinking the water. That's correct. But we don't, and we don't have, they have not done air quality testing correct. to know if. And what's the, the, what's, the distance, what's the distance between the building and that well site? About 800 feet. And, this, and the distance that N.C. Diener has regulation for with regard to vapor uh, testing is within 100 feet? That's correct. But that, that is a, and, that, and that's a monitoring well. Right, I understand. Right, and not a vapor intrusion well. So there is a difference there. But the, the groundwater data in, in that M, MW15 cluster really carries no weight as far as you know, vapor intrusion in, in central office and maintenance building. That's what, that's what I was going to ask you is, is groundwater is groundwater monitoring indicative of vapor intrusion? Well, that may be too broad a question, but well, yeah, I mean, I mean, you, I, you, dig, you dig groundwater wells to see if you have groundwater contamination. Right. And, and this whole vapor intrusion phenomenon, I can explain, is a fairly new one. And, and uh, Dean are still, they're still working out the kinks. And, and, but they've come up with this 100 foot radius where, uh, where, you, where if, you're, you know, if your vapors are above certain concentrations, then you have to address them. Okay. But by, by being able to test this uh, MW20D,
It does, but if there was a high level of something, it seems like that would show up. And it may be not from the water, it may be from something else. But, but that's well, well, a non scientific way. <laughs> Oh yeah, I mean we can, you know, you can <coughs> test the air. We can we went through the intensive air testing with our tuning schools and all. And, uh, but that, once again, that 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 no way scanning this air with a handheld monitor, it, it, it's it's really not showing <coughs> what uh, what we're addressing here. Talk about the as far as the soil. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I have a question about where do you been sending us those annual reports from the monitoring on 15 and 15 D. Did they send this to Buncombe County Schools or just to Dina? To, just to Dina. Not even the county government that owns this? I, I, I don't know the answer who to that. Would, who would know if the county was getting those reports? I am Adam Square D. May ask is the appropriate time for have a representative from NCD that would come in along the square D and answer more specific questions because I, um, I I learned enough to know that it's a very complex issue. Uh, but what I want to assure the board is that we're you know, since being made aware with the February letter that we're working to make sure every precaution is taken and that we're doing specific testing. impact us in any way, shape, or form on campus. At this time, I'd like to turn this over to Christy and her proceed on and uh, allow Mr. Fairley also to talk with you regarding this. Thank you, Attributes that each of our 
elementary, middle, and high school will start looking at to see how we are going through STEM. You notice this green section over here. In order to apply to be a North Carolina STEM school program or um, school, you have to come over here in this prepare or target section. So this was our GPA. And this, you'll notice, the areas in black there are highlighted. And if you really look at them, they very much align with the non-negotiable that Dr. Ball will present in you. So this, if I could say a command, and let it speak back to us on the roadmap. This was our roadmap that we worked from. So I just, yes, okay. So this was, there were the attributes. So then we want you to know who was on our committee. In your handbook, or in your notebook, your, our committee members are listed, and you're very colorful because they were split up by committee. And I just want to thank our two board representatives, Ann Franklin and Lisa Bowen. They were so good for us. And each of them provided us very good dialogue. They provided us good information, and I certainly do just say thank you to both of them. Um, I probably pestered them a lot. I apologize for that. But I need your help and information. I can explain to Lisa, I could have your help. And she would say, okay. So I do certainly appreciate them, and I truly hope that they have shared their experience with you. Uh, also, we had Buncombe County School educators and staff, so at this time, if you're in here and you represent Buncombe County School educators and staff, would you please stand? Thank you for your commitment so much to this committee. It was very important also that we had our business and industries represented. So, we had tremendous representation not only from key business, our chamber was here. I was so very, very thankful. So if you represent our business and industry community, would you please stand? And Jess is here from the chamber. So we certainly appreciate her. Uh, our post-secondary partners, we were so blessed to include them and have them on this committee to guide us. They did a phenomenal job. And so anybody representing post-secondary, if you're here, we will just say thank you and say, uh, thank you for that opportunity. And then two government representatives, and I know Holly's here, so I'll ask Holly to stand, and we certainly did appreciate her. And we also had a connection with the <coughs> governor's office, who we've been keeping in constant contact with as well. So those were our committee members, and they gave countless hours of time. Countless hours. And so I just truly, truly thank everyone for their support. They tell you, I would say you're going to get emails from me, and I know when that came across their screen, they probably went, oh, there's that email. But they worked hard, and I really do appreciate your commitment to this committee. Suzanne is going to speak about the timeline, and then we will be back for some more interaction, because it does get exciting. From your notebook agenda, you will see that we did spend a lot of time researching what we wanted our STEM school to look like. We visited other sites across North Carolina, such as Highland School of Technology, the Weaver Center, Philip O'Berry, Hopewell High School. We did Teaching the Digital Generation. Margaret Small is our researcher in the curriculum department, and she provided many, many articles for us. So we really tried to be very broad in our research base, including we had various speakers come to speak with us about different STEM initiatives. Dr. Sam Houston, the President and CEO of the North Carolina Science, Technology, Math, and Education Center. Dr. Tony Habit with the New Schools Project. Dr. Bill Harrison, the Chair of the State Board of Education. All telling us what their vision of STEM across North Carolina would be. We spent a good bit of time in, in our committee work. We have worked with this summer refining what we're presenting with you today and we're up to the August board work session. In the meantime, we are working on curriculum offerings. The facilities plan is changing daily. Jan is thinking about marketing. And how do we take that roadshow out to the community and share with the community and get their input on what this new school will look like? We are trying to do that in the fall, and then we want construction to begin in December. Spring will be busy as 
As you can imagine, if this school moves forward, as we hope it will, we will need to identify a principal and have a face behind that. As we go out and meet with families and stakeholders, they need to know who's going to be leading this wonderful new school. Again, more marketing, more informing the stakeholders, and then going in and recruiting the very best teachers because this building will look different. It won't <coughs> be a traditional kind of school and classroom setting that we all grew up in. And we will need time to recruit staff students and then do a lot of professional development. And then the summer will be orientating all of those who will be coming here and starting hopefully next August. As I mentioned, curriculum and instruction will look differently, so Cleveland Blankenship will share with you. Christy, as you said, is good on the homework thing, so we're breezing through this to, to meet our timeline. If you do have any questions about any of this uh, later on, then, then uh, we'll be glad to address them. Uh, talking about the, the instructional approach, how is this high school going to look different? It, in regards to the instruction, in regards to what goes on in the classroom. But we're going to really focus on project-based learning. And that's uh, pretty near and dear to my heart because I was a former career tech teacher who taught electronics and uh, metals technology. And we really focus on projects. But when you think about project learning and the math applications, the science applications, uh, the uh, language arts and the social studies, all of that uh, coordinated and integrated together for project-based learning. Guided inquiry. I was in probably one of the most intense professional developments uh, of my career last week with our science folks and there's there something uh, uh, put on through the Smithsonian Institute. It's called a laser training. Jan was with us for, uh, Jan Webster out of Risa helped put that together for our region and it was a great, uh, great focus on science and the guided inquiry method of learning science really helps with the students understanding not only what happens, but why it happens. And that's really important. Group work, learning to work collaboratively, problem solving. Uh, there's a couple of videos, uh, just the links referenced here on the PowerPoint. We're not going to take time to play those today. But they can show a little bit more information about the uh, project-based learning. And also, the bottom link that's a little longer is a video about uh, New Tech High School and that's the type of vision that we're looking for in this school. But again, as far as the instructional approach, we're going to focus on collaborative work. We're also going to uh, focus on a blended instruction where we're integrating core subjects and, and uh, content or related to the real world to make it applicable for the students. And uh, that will help prepare them for making good decisions uh, as they go about the problem solving. Mr. Knox lives here from, from our early college, and they have an intense focus in that small school environment on teaching and learning. In a small school environment, you can really work with your staff, your administration, and everyone together to develop best practices on teaching and learning. An example of that would be the rounds model of professional development for the teachers. That started in the, in the early college over on the AB Tech campus, and now is being replicated in some of our other comprehensive high schools in the county. And that is what we're looking for with this STEM school, to be a small school environment that is innovative and leads to uh, better education for the students that then can be replicated in our comprehensive high schools as well. Quality of life. Quality of life. I'll take it. 
Three or four. Beautiful. Okay, here we go. So all those qualities are there. So when we designed this concept of STEM school, we really looked to actually <coughs> for a workforce development model, and we came up with community innovation and sustainability as an overarching thing. That's what you said. That was what you said. <laughs> you got there just in a different way. It's very, very important for students to be able to be economic survivors. In this day and age, we cannot equip students any better than to ensure them that they have transferable skills that they can take out with them. We do not know in 20 years what skills they're going to need. Did you know in 20 years ago what skills you would need now? You didn't know an iPad when it did 20 years ago. But you're thankful you took typing, remember, in high school. That's a transferable skill. We've just got to ensure that we replicate whatever we can do for our students. So we're very excited about this because what we want to do is bring back our students who maybe go away. It's good for them to go away to school, but we want to bring them back and make them a strong part of our economy. So when we, as the committee, thought about Buckingham <coughs> and Asheville, uh, about the words you said, we think of the job market and what kind of jobs will be in this area. And truly, if you think of applied engineering and technology, you see that with our advanced manufacturing partners, that wonderful gaming community that we have, we can hit this highlight. And then we're all about hospitality and tourism and environmental studies. And we can definitely see ourselves in sustainable tourism. So this is exciting for us. We want this STEM school to replicate what our community is, that we're going to ensure economic success for our students. So with these two overarching things of applied engineering and technology and hospitality and tourism and environmental studies, and you'll notice for future consideration is integrated and innovative medicine. Now, you can cheat. This is in your handbook in the back, okay? but I like it up here. So, through an effort of Project Lead the Way, which is already in our middle schools, and please note that I know this is a linear model, but please realize this will be fluid, okay, and ever changing, but this is kind of what it's going to look like. So you just kind of have to go with me here. So you might have students that love engineering, and they may be able to take this engineering um, kind of piece over here, or they, we desperately need to ensure our kids can look at computers and programming. Computer programming is a must. Uh, so we might have kids a lot of that. In the food science world, there's nothing better than knowing how E. coli starts, okay? And that's very important. So we have that in there too. And sh how many of you own your own business? That's fair entrepreneurship. The chamber has a five by five initiative, but overlaying everything is entrepreneurship. We have to make sure, you know, that that's in there. And then over here, it could be climatology, but we might have a student that loves forensics or biotech and agri-science or whatever it may be. We want the possibilities for them to be endless. This is a key component, shadowing mentorship, internship. We have to make sure that our walls are not closed here, that community is our resources and our student learning doesn't stop here it's out there in that real world. Often sometimes it's better to figure out what you don't like to do than what you like to do. Why don't she point to you? Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, also our partners and we know that extension will go with AB Tech, NC State. Students can take courses from different of uh, many partners, <coughs> including the North Carolina School of Science and Math, where we desperately need to tap those resources. So we're very <coughs> excited about this model. Think about a company wanting to come to Buncombe County and just can say, we have a STEM school that can equip <coughs> our students, you know, <coughs> bring your business here. It always gets home for me when in the newspaper, the true test of the career builder, when Eaton Corporation is running ads and they need engineers and they need AutoCAD and they need Microsoft, this is where the rubber meets road. We may need to make sure we're teaching our kids what they need to be. And the date of that would be all animals. 
this was June 24th, 2020. So that's um, kind of the concept chart. Please know it's fluid and what it looks like there, you know, opportunities are going to be endless for students. So that's exciting. Yep, yeah, I'm done. Leland's going to go with what we know. <laughs> Okay, what we know. Opening fall 2013. That is our goal. Uh, when we open up, though, similar, very similar, and we've learned a lot through the rollout of Berkeley College. It's not to go, we can't go full scale all four grades at one time. But what we like to do is roll in 75 ninth graders and then invite 25 of the, of the 10th grade class to also uh, be a part of that first cohort here. And again, it, because this is a different school, a different curriculum, we really, though, refer to all of, these, all of these students as year one attending. The academics will be a variety of blended courses, college courses and honors courses. And we talk, when we talk about blended and integrated, an example, and nothing's set in stone there, our curriculum department will be working very hard on the design of these courses, but also collaborating with other other educational ent entities such as the North Carolina School for Science and Math, uh, our own early college is a good example that is, that is blended some courses. But we may have a language arts and a social studies class blended also with a heavy integration of technology to accomplish three goals there. And, and that's some key, key to the design is to have some integrated courses. Students can either choose a major, and you sort of, you saw a little bit of majors on the chart uh, that, that Ms. Cheek presented there, but don't feel like that's going to lock us in. That is an example of how a student could progress to the school. We also want the students to have some flexibility to explore an alternative course based on their interest. Now, don't, we'll, we as a school system, we will have to help that student match those interests with educational opportunities, but again, going outside the four walls of the school, looking at post-secondary education partners, both in the surrounding community and through distance learning. Um, we're also in the, in the exploration about being a, head, a hub or satellite campus for the North Carolina School of Science and Math. They have some pretty exciting opportunities available through distance learning that we want to take advantage of. Health and PE, you know, you look at that bullet and you think, okay, why, why is that there? Ask Tim. <laughs> When you've got a design to accommodate a physical education class, it throws another wrinkle in the business. I mean, in the business of designing a school. And it is a North Carolina graduation requirement. Not only the physical education portion, but also the health portion. Those are graduation requirements. One of the things that I want to point out, though, on this slide, while we're still talking about the blended courses, we will be seeking innovative status for this school. And we're exploring different methods of doing that because that gives us some of the flexibility to design the curriculum in the best interest of the students. We've talked to a gentleman named Rob Hines with the Department of Public Instruction. He is sort of our contact with DPI in this process. You've also heard a reference to Dr. Sam Houston, who's the president and CEO of the North Carolina Science, Mathematics, and Technology Education Center. That's another partner that we've explored some options with. And then Dr. Tony Hammond that, that, that Ms. Palmer also spoke about with the uh, New Schools Project. So we're looking at different things, uh, ways to do that. Okay, all year one, when we're talking about our, our curriculum offerings for our students, we really want to give them a foundation in year one and, and I, I use this description when I talk to students counseling. I've also used this with my own uh, children as they've gone through school. To build a strong, rigorous base that allows them lots of options in the future. And part of that would be the foundations of information technology and the introduction to engineering. There are concepts taught in introduction to engineering that are easily transferable into many career paths to learn how to think of you know, how you design a solution to a problem. That's absolutely in all sorts of uh, career paths. All students will have an individualized graduation plan. We want to work with the students to help them design how they're going to graduate from high school. We will still have to meet North Carolina graduation requirements, but exactly how we nail that down and what we provide for those students, we hope to have some flexibility. 
again, part of that is becoming an innovative high school. That's, that's the world we're living in. But that technology, not only one-to-one, -one, but also as we're using it as teachers, as we're presenting information, but part of the collaborative work is to take the teacher away from the presentation station and have the student at the presentation station where they're solving problems, they're presenting their solutions to their peers and, uh, and working together with that. But again, rigorous early grade levels to prepare that crawl phase and then options for the senior year. I think Ms. Cheek referenced moving outside of the four, uh, excuse me, having opportunities to individualize by going outside, and I, I mentioned that too. Options for their senior year because of that broad phase. You see all that different options we're exploring. Too much to read right now. Okay. So in your packet there is this chart that we will, uh, we'll just reference this and go on. This is a chart we're very excited about because it does show all of our uh, partners and our connections as far as majors and chances uh, or opportunities for our students. So it does look like uh, post-secondary connections either through college and career promise, online, being able to earn college credit while in high school. Also, our community will buy in and we know it's very, very important to have a great mentorship, internship site where students can work out there in that field, get that wonderful job experience. Anybody, do you remember, now those of you who are educators, you did student teaching, so it's kind of coupling with that. And again, uh, it's better to figure it out maybe before you go spend all your money and figure out what you like and what you don't like. So this is valuable valuable work experience for our students and to be able to place them in our business community and open up our doors and then open up their doors for us. We're very excited about these uh, chances for our students. So as far as next steps, um, we do know we have to survey our stakeholders with our parents, students, and our community. And then of course it's marketing and getting that word out to the parents, students, and community. And we know that's got to be our next step. We just needed to get this concept chart out, get it to you, let you see the work that our committee has done. We're very excited about it. It is something we have been working hard on, and we're certainly ready to get ready for the future. So we hope y'all see the excitement and the hard work, and I will tell you that um, we're ready to rock and roll. So Tim Fearley, if you'll look at my last slide, it's just an excellent prompt into Tim and going forward in the building for the future. So he's going to come and then at the end of Tim's presentation, I'm going to ask Lisa and Ann if they would like to um, present anything from the committee or give input on what they think. Good afternoon. I'm going to take you for uh, a little tour of the, the facility here. We um, really held off putting a design out there and let the committee kind of develop the concepts before we kind of rush to conclusions. So right now this, this design is out there kind of being vetted by um, our directors. We've got comments from the committee and I think someone said it's, it's changing on a daily basis. Well, it, it is. But in the, the details, really, I think the big concepts that I'm going to show you uh, are pretty accurate and seem to have uh, held up to the, uh, the comments that we've received. So we started with assumptions, and this is a repeat of a lot, a lot of the things that you've heard already. So I'm going to kind of quickly go through these because we're a little bit behind. But uh, I'll hit some uh, highlights here. Uh, this school may operate 16 hours a day, uh, six days a week. That is a, has a real challenge, I think, to security and, and access. 
the, uh, the functions of the school, we plan on kind of three main uh, curriculum strands. It doesn't mean when I show you the plan that you can't walk across the hall and use spaces associated with the other strands, but the, uh, we're trying to produce some things that are unique and supportive of the individual strand. We have to provide PE on site. That is a big one. Uh, ProStart is a food service program that we're planning. It uses more residential level uh, equipment. It's not a, a full uh, culinary program like you might see at AV Tech, but uh, it is rigorous. Uh, kids wear uh, uniforms, and uh, we hope to keep that front and center. What you won't see in the plan is something labeled a media center. The uh, Innovative school designation will allow us to vary not only in the curriculum but in the facilities to support the, uh, the the curriculum that is occurring. Technology is going to be so ingrained in this school that the media center is basically everywhere in this school. Probably the big point I'd like to make here is that in designing at a traditional K-12 school, the classroom is the basic unit. That unit is repeated over and over. It may vary slightly by grade level, but the classroom is the biggest, is the, the basis for design. In this school, the group spaces are, and we're going to offer a, a big variety of collaborative spaces, large and small, and in the character to support these uh, student-led collaborative learning. So I'll orient you here on our building. We are right here in the board auditorium, or the board auditorium, yes. This is the old CEC area, and primarily we're locating the school in that area. It's a high bay space, 29 feet to the bar joist. That's a blessing and a curse. It makes some aspects of construction difficult, maybe more costly, but it's a very flexible space, so it, it really will accommodate what we're trying to do here. There is a, a mezzanine, maybe not everyone knows about that, but that's where our child nutrition department is currently located. They would be located out of there, as well as our testing department that is, is right here, so that we can keep isolation between the administrative uses and the school uses. And again, remember that six days a week thing because kids may be in internships. We need to maintain an isolation not only from the administrators going in there, the public going into the school, but also from the school kids getting into the administration area and off hours. The biggest point is uh, the former CEC entrance was right here and the kids had their cafeteria here and then draped through and through into the CEC and the administration was going this way. There was a lot of inter, you know, intermingling of the two that we're going to try to avoid by, first of all, locating the new STEM entrance in the rear here and, and keeping STEM in this area and keeping the admin out here. We do have our maintenance department and the technology department on the perimeter and a few other uses on the perimeter that could ultimately become expansion area for STEM. In order to meet the deadline, uh, we're going to need to phase this project. Um, those are the three phases I'm proposing. This, again, is this <coughs> STEM area here. So in uh, fall of, of 2012, we need to start uh, demolition and relocation and get kind of a head start on that. And that's kind of the area that would be involved. And then phase two would conclude with occupancy for that ninth grade and partial 10th grade in the fall of 2013. So if the entrance is here, we can draw a pretty good line and, and separate the, uh, the students that are, are here from construction activities that will be ongoing here. There's a number of things like an elevator that will need to be put in that takes a long, long time to do. We couldn't finish that in time. Also, the commercial kitchen area is in here. That is That also has kind of a, a long lead time. Difficult to complete by fall of 2013. 
And then the final phase uh, would be this, in its, in its full completion. Um, I'll show you a few of the spaces in here. So, well, there's a mezzanine, so in, the, in fall of 2012, we can do demolition and do some work. But that wouldn't be available for phase two. It would be available in phase three, the completion, uh, ready for summer of 2014 and, and fall of 2014. So here are some of the spaces. A student center. That is going, we're going to use terminology that's more like a DTAC and junior college terminology than uh, our typical schools. We're going to raise the bar for it. But there will be a student center and it'll be a meeting place. It'll be a place to, to eat and to uh, bring in uh, students, uh, uh, our stakeholders in after hours time. We can isolate that from the rest of the school if need be. The advisory center is as close as we can get to a media center in this school. But really what its importance is, is this, these T's around here are where the teacher's offices are. And they're not going to be closed offices. They're going to be open offices. Spaces will be shared uh, because we'll have uh, some adjunct teachers coming in, perhaps some uh, folks in the, in the business area. But this is where the students meet the teachers. We're calling it an advisory center. It's, it's where that student project can be proposed to a teacher or if some additional help is needed, uh, touching base, because these kids will be working in more in a group format. Then we have a number of smaller spaces. The seminar areas here will be flexible. And they'll be set up probably as close to a classroom as, uh, as we'll have in this school, but it'll be tables. Now, there won't be any student desks, individual student desks. There'll be configurable tables in a seminar format. And then we have group rooms for the, uh, the collaborative learning in these areas. Then we have very small group rooms. These that came in here are for those individual uh, groups, two, three, four students that are working on a project together where they can go in an acoustically isolated area and hash out their, their project, argue, uh, and come out of there with a game plan. Distance learning, we heard how that's going to be important. Uh, not only will it be important that these kids have the option of getting distance learning opportunities that are outside the walls of the school, but we'll have the capability when this becomes a, a successful school to broadcast distance learning perhaps to our high schools and to, and to others to take advantage of the unique classes that are offered here. Scale up is a, I'll show you a picture of what this looks like. This is a concept of uh, collaborative learning that is taking hold across the country. It was developed by a professor at NC State and it is uh, group learning with heavily um, laden with technology. It's, uh, it, it, there, there's a lot of argument and debate. It's a larger space. There's multiple groups that go out and solve a problem, then maybe come back and present to, to the, uh, the larger group outside of their small groups. We have to provide some sort of PE, and we're proposing a gymnatorium. That, it'll have a, a stage very similar to our uh, intermediate schools, except it'll be more half of a basketball court size uh, with a sports floor. So it's a multi-purpose space, but it also can be an assembly space for presentation. I'm proposing that we relocate this board auditorium to a larger space that can be available here. It's a very unfinished space. Uh, this is something we may want to bid as a, a bid alternate because uh, it, it's not absolutely necessary for STEM, but it would be a, a multi-purpose space that could serve the board, allow uh, appropriate videotaping, good acoustics, decent seating, some kind of low-rise, elevated fixed seating with some uh, <coughs> area that we can put additional seats in if we have a big crowd or a performance space. It can serve STEM for their uh, largest presentations in here, and it can also serve the larger administration area as a meeting and presentation space, as well as for teacher development. 
Then the labs, those are the things that are unique to each of the strands where they have specific equipment. So say engineering has a robotics. Well, that equipment would be housed in a lab here. Perhaps you'd design it here, move across, and this would be more workshop-like, where in the, um, the communications or computer or technology side, their lab would look more like a computer lab. Gaming, graphics, those sorts of things. And we do need to provide a, 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 a dedicated science lab for chemistry and, and all those uses as well. We have some administration space in the vicinity of the student center and uh, a kitchen. And then some peripheral spaces that are around it. Uh, testing is currently housed in here. We would relocate. Newcomer center are students. Uh, we'd leave them there, and they probably would end up eating in the in the student center. Not as concerned about the uh, the mixing of those kids. We still we think we have these warehouses over here, but we need warehouse space. So we've preserved right now two warehouse spaces that we can continue to use. And uh, if in the future STEM is very successful, we need more space. Perhaps we build a metal building out here somewhere for the warehouse space need teacher training area, we already have a computer lab. Perhaps some of the teachers are adjunct and uh, need a, a little update on, on this new uh, teaching model here and what they're gonna see, what we can do, can have a, uh, a training area within there. We've relocated conference room A and B to what is the, uh, uh, what we're calling now conference room C. Uh, we do some uh, upgrades there for acoustics and such. And then if the board does locate to this minatorium, then we could have uh, conference room C in this location. Take out the diocese and the elevation, and this would be an excellent room for uh, countywide meetings and such. On the mezzanine, we produce another strand where we have similar things uh, that we saw down below, but on a slightly smaller scale the learning lab and we need to uh, detail exactly what this what's needed inside we haven't gotten to that point yet so here's some images of that have been sent to me by our committee members that we've gathered from uh, research and such uh, what we've heard is this needs to look and feel different it needs to be a dynamic uh, feel once we're in here so the student center is uh, a big meeting place it functions as a cafeteria, but also uh, for study on laptops and, and group meetings. The advisory center, again, is where student meets the teacher for individualized guidance. Our group rooms have a variety of sizes. You can see the collaborative learning uh, is, is a theme that we visit over and over again. Small group rooms, so uh, perhaps we'll use some uh, shipping containers like they've done here. Put them up on the mezzanine and blow out the ends, put glass in there so you can see the action, but it's acoustically isolated. It would give that, that kind of industrial, uh, high-tech feel that I think we need to promote in here, which will be much more cost-effective than doing a very fit and finished uh, facility in a, a high bay former warehouse space. Here's a, the scale-up room. This one's, I think, at the University of Minnesota. Um, again, NC State is where they develop, but you can see these collaborative spaces, a lot of technology. They can tap into these and then show the rest of the students what, how they're dealing with the project. The teacher's desk is typically in the middle, and they may start out with a very small lecture, but the students quickly get into the, uh, the small groups and problem solve. The learning labs will be unique to the uses, so if it's uh, food service related, it may look something like this, but if it's technology related, it may look a lot more like the computer lab that we're used to seeing. Distance learning, the connection with the, the outside, uh, two-way connection with the outside, that's critical. It'll help us uh, meet those core requirements as well as expand this program to other schools. So we have a lot of questions left, and I won't go through these, but uh, we've got a lot of detailing that still needs to be done, a lot of questions to ask, but I think we've got a, uh, 
a game plan that will house uh, very well the STEM plan that the committee has developed and that curriculum has developed. And, and if the board chooses to uh, proceed, uh, we'll continue to, to develop these details and insert them into our plan. Question? to a request this week that asked where are we getting this type of student from and they wanted us to demonstrate that um, because this particular client was going back for investment looking to grow their business and they said well we're looking at a different part of the state why should we stay in western North Carolina and one of the reasons that we proposed was this is a possibility within our community we have to have it I'll say Mr. Blankenship referenced last week when we had the National Science Research Center from the Smithsonian come out and work for a week with teams from all across the western region. We had 16 school systems that designed a five-year science plan, including Buncombe County, and um, that's all that they talked about. 
and it was really neat to also take the teachers out to some of our businesses, Borg Warner, Eden, uh, Biltmore Estate, the Germ Plaza at Biltmore, or no, Bent Creek Institute, if you haven't seen that, that's amazing. Um, but it was really neat to see the excitement from the teachers and also hear the national impact of what's going on. And this is just really right on target. Uh, if you talk to Borg Warner in particular, they're looking for those engineers right now. So I'm excited. I have a sixth grader, and I'm really excited that this might be a possibility for her. Uh, Ms. Franklin, Ms. Hall, members of the community, anything you want to say? It's exciting to work with members of the community in, in an educational setting and to see and get the feel for what's out there. And I really appreciate the opportunity to do that myself, but also to, to have that connection so that I can see, I don't always visualize well, so I can actually see out there what's available. And um, it's exciting to be at a place where we can provide this for our students. Um, we give lip service, well, not lip service. We talk about the 21st century what those skills are. And this is the 21st century and what the skills are. And uh, to be poised to provide that for all of our students. I'm proud of our system for doing that. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to bring up from the, the viewpoint of a board member, um, I think STEM is you know, something that's long overdue in Buncombe County, this type of school. I think it's an excellent idea. Um, I'm concerned about what I call the elephants in the room. The fiscal implications have not been discussed. They haven't been vetted by the board. Uh, in fact, the board wasn't even approached to approve uh, the, the start of this whole process, uh, which I've described in detail before at board meetings as a circumventing of the board uh, rather than uh, coming to us first and uh, getting approval to start these projects and getting our seal of approval on that. Uh, I think. We're skirting the whole environmental issue here uh, with this building, and there's a lot of questions to be asked. Why hasn't anyone done any testing in the past, knowing that we had vocational students here, that the CEC was here, we have the Newcomer Center, we have students coming all the time, and we have 287 parts per billion of TCE and a monitoring well very close to the building on the property. Uh, this sounds like a cover-up to me. Uh, why wasn't anybody investigating this. Um, do we really care about our students or do we care about our appearances? Uh, and speaking of appearances, at the committee meetings, um, I experienced going through the motions of getting stakeholder input. I didn't see any of it put into the actual plan in here. Um, we talked about parent interest surveys uh, being very important. I thought we should have learned something from the Coons Intermediate experience that we did not uh, start looking to parents till construction started on the Coons building and we had many unhappy parents. Uh, we still do. Uh, we ended up probably spending a lot more money than we would have normally because uh, an elementary school model was uh, what was proposed for that building and parents were like, no way, we want uh, unified arts for our sixth graders. We want band, chorus, string, string orchestra, all those things that they would <coughs> normally have in a sixth grade experience. So I think I am. I bring up the concerns that were never addressed in these meetings that were brought up. What about music? What about fine arts in a STEM high school? Those are questions parents want to know the answers to, and, and they want these things for their kids, and the kids desire these things uh, to be a well-rounded person and find their niche. And sports, we're not even addressing, you know, where would the sports program be? And uh, here we are talking about starting construction in December. And when I say fiscal implications, uh, what I've heard is $4 million proposed for the renovation and using, now I just heard the lottery funds, potentially. But um, Buncombe County uh, is in debt by $140 million for school properties. And, uh, you know, we're not looking at the big picture. This all sounds like cosmetics to me. That, you know, we're trying to get good PR. Uh, but before we can build something like this, uh, we've got to dig deeper. Uh, Nobody talked about collaborating with UNC Asheville. Many uh, UNC campuses have uh, high schools on the property. You know, why was this never your right? Why did we just start with the central office and not even look at other options? 
Uh, there's schools within a school. Right here we have Asheville High School with a school within a school. Uh, we can't keep spending money like nobody's business. Uh, we have to look at living within our means and even making maybe a, a better choice uh, if we do, you know, utilize the university's resources by being on their campus. Um, and you can see this uh, collaboration happening with private colleges, not just public universities, all throughout the state. Uh, we're on the back end of the curve when it comes to starting a STEM high school. And we've got lots of great models out there to look at. Uh, another concern brought up in our meeting was that there was, um, everybody was looking at STEM schools within the state of North Carolina. Well, if you just saw the recent results, uh, I think it was U.S. News and World Report. Uh, the top 250 STEM high schools, not a single one was located in North Carolina. If we want to compete globally, why aren't we looking to the, these schools for models that are the top schools? Uh, you know, I see a lot of problems here. I see this is the kind of vetting that the school board should have done initially. Uh, you know, and maybe look at these different uh, collaborative, collaborative efforts we could have had with AB Tech, UNCA, uh, the school within a school. We have excess capacity in our existing schools. We have got to iron out our attendance uh, lines. We need to look at redrawing those. We've got so many issues that we need to fix before we can even think about starting a new school. I can't even imagine. Um, we created unintended consequences by building the intermediate schools because now we have under uh, crowding, under enrollment at uh, Valley Springs and Cane Creek Middle School. Uh, we are not maximizing the efficiency of our facilities. Uh, the school board needs better data to make decisions with, and we're not getting it. So these are things I'm going to bring up tonight at the 6.30 meeting, and uh, we'll be making some motions uh, in these areas. But again, we, we need a STEM high school. I just don't know if this is the right direction. Uh, I know it hasn't been vetted by the board. Ms. Ball, Ms. Franklin, I know we need to go ahead and transition, but I want to thank both of you for being involved in every meeting and representing this board in the process and having an opportunity to uh, convey your concerns throughout the entire process that involved a lot of stakeholders that we've pointed out tonight. And I do want to end by saying that tonight you're going to hear a presentation from Mr. Jeff Gorsuch regarding uh, our ABC performance from, uh, from, uh, from uh, the previous year, uh, 11 and 12. And, uh, I did a quick look at state data because all the performances are now available via the web across the state. What you're going to see, uh, you're going to hear tonight that early college is an innovative high school, similar to what we're proposing here. 100% of their students that are exceeded standards in academic performance. I don't think that's just not in here, but I don't believe that's ever occurred in the history of Boston County since the ABC's been put in place. It's incredible. One, and, and again, uh, I, I may be, this is quick math because I was trying to run through all 150 systems at school, but I truly believe it's one of 15. But the key is to look at the 15. And what you're seeing of those 15 with that type of performance, and you move it up to 95% to 100%, what you're seeing are schools projected just like this. The specialized, the 21st century, the curriculum, the instruction, that we're hearing. So uh, again, I, I, uh, we'll be bringing certainly much more information to you and we'll be addressing some concerns we heard tonight. We'll be bringing you those specifics as we always do. Uh, that will be coming to you uh, via email over the month and certainly at our next board meeting we'll be, we'll be doing another presentation. So this time I, I, I'd like to turn this over to Mr. Fair. So we're going to transition to, um, go ahead. Before the, our, Holly and Jan, and I think I <laughs> yeah, Jan, come back in and help. Yeah. Uh, in, in, in spite of what I think may have just been stated by one board member with regard to her opinion, it appears to me that the 39 members of this committee did an excellent job, including all of the representatives from the various school systems and which included uh, individuals from UNCA, B Tech, and uh, uh, one of the other secondary, post-secondary schools. 
I want to thank you. Uh, as, as a board member, I want to thank you uh, for the work that you did and all the other members of the committee. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we're going to transition to an update, and we we got Michael Shore here from FLS Energy. He can uh, tell you where we are and, and answer your questions regarding it. Um, Michael, we cut your time. We're really short, so you can uh, kind of get through. I think we need to we need to be out of here by five, right? Yeah. So. Quarter to five. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no problem. I just uh, brought a few slides with me. Uh, and let me say, I heard the economic development person uh, talk about a, um, a company that was threatening to leave beautiful Western North Carolina. That's not us. And I am very excited about this kind of uh, school. It, I, I, we have 70 employees here, and uh, these are the type of uh, students, or these are the type of people that we hire for uh, in our company. Uh, so let me let me um, just uh, before I, I get into the agenda, I'll just show you some pictures of some projects that we've done, just so you get a sense of what we do. Uh, we are a solar development company. We develop uh, commercial scale solar hot water and solar electric projects, and uh, we have. We're headquartered here in Western North Carolina, and we have projects coast to coast from, from uh, Wilmington all the way to uh, San Francisco. And uh, in fact, uh, here in, at Camp Lejeune, we're putting uh, solar on thousands of homes, <coughs> providing uh, our military servicemen uh, energy. And then I, I share this one with you to connect with the, the STEM presentation that you just heard. Uh, this is about 20 minutes away in Haywood County at the Evergreen Packaging Facility. Uh, we have a, about four acres of solar panels and a 20-year contract with Cargress Energy to sell them the electricity. And we regularly have high school students come out and tour this facility, and we'd love to have uh, STEM uh, high school students uh, do that and, and do studies on, on this technology, which is becoming very much a part of how we meet our energy in, in the United States. Okay, so very quickly, uh, Tim asked me to give you an, an update, so I'm going to cover three things in just a couple of minutes. Uh, one is, uh, is uh, the project timeline, just what, what's happened, uh, key questions that you might have, I'm anticipating those, and so I'll, I'll answer what they are, and then, and then uh, a brief uh, touch on, the, on that point three up there. Uh, just to remind you uh, what this project is. There's a, a solar electric component, which is uh, 200 kilowatts. That's about a three quarter of a million dollar project. And then also a, a smaller solar hot water uh, project as well. And you might remember uh, from previous uh, discussion of, of this project that the way FLS Energy works is we uh, develop the project, we pay for it, we finance it, and then we earn our uh, our keep uh, from selling the energy that's generated from the project as well as uh, any incentives out there, uh, we take those. And just uh, so you know, we have uh, uh, hundreds of projects that we have developed and here's just a, a sampling of projects that FLS Energy has developed and owned and owns in Western North Carolina and elsewhere. And so this is a great win-win. Uh, where we're providing energy to our clients at less than they'd be paying for conventional energy and uh, certainly creating jobs and, and uh, helping the environment as well. So the project timeline, in the summer of 2011, uh, FLS Energy submitted and won the RFP that uh, the Buncombe County School System uh, put out. By the fall, we had developed a preliminary design for the solar project. And then, and we started our process or continued our process to find a financial partner to develop the project. And so, naturally, key, you know, if this is a close to a million dollar project, uh, it is critical for us to have financial partners to, to develop the projects. And, and so, we, uh, we were uh, very much engaged in that research, in that search in the fall. And, and uh, through the winter and summer, and unfortunately, we have not succeeded in finding the right uh, type of investor for this project yet. Uh, in the winter, there were some uh, limitations regarding the Progress Energy SunSense program. You can ask me questions about that. 
if you'd like, and, and uh, here's, uh, here's where we are now. Uh, we had a particular uh, financial partner in mind. Uh, they backed out in March, and so we are still in the process to, cobalt, to cultivate a, a new uh, investor for the project. And we are unable to develop the project w without an investor. So I have three questions that, that are probably on your minds. Uh, first is, why can't we proceed at this time? And we, uh, as I just said, we do not have a financial partner lined up. Uh, there is a, certainly a possibility this year that we can get a financial partner lined up to do all or part of the project, and, and we are uh, targeting also to, to work on this project in 2013. If it doesn't happen uh, this year, the challenge, a challenge, just so you all you know, understand what's possible, is as uh, solar becomes more mainstream and more accepted, uh, the financial institutions out there have a tendency to want to invest in larger and larger projects. Where a few years ago, uh, million dollar projects were very common uh, for banks and, and other investors to, to, to put their money into. Uh, today, the solar market gravitates towards projects that are much larger. So that's, that's kind of the challenge for us, is that this project is smaller uh, than, than, the, than the target that's out there. In some ways, it's, a, it's almost a success of the industry where, you know, five years ago there were, there were no solar projects, and, and three years ago a, a million dollar project was a large project, and now uh, you know, $10 million, $100 million projects are commonly being developed in North Carolina and across the country. Okay, just a couple more slides. So what are the prospects for Muncombe County Schools to, uh, to get uh, solar going? I'd say in the near term, it's challenging. Uh, we're, there are only a small handful of companies in North Carolina that have the financial and, uh, and wherewithal to, to, to develop and own uh, projects uh, the way that we do. Uh, certainly, the school system is always welcome to, to purchase uh, the project on your own. Uh, but like many of our clients, uh, you have capital that you want to put elsewhere so when you're able to have a, a third party come in, kind of like a utility, develop a project, own the project, and then you buy the energy for you know, an equivalent or lower cost than your conventional energy, that, that, that's a pretty good deal. And so we still hope to be able to provide that service to you, but uh, that may or may not be the case. Um, over the long term, uh, the prospects are good. Uh, solar, the costs of solar are declining Dramatically, it's unbelievable what is happening to this industry. So here's my last two slides. One is just so you have a sense. Uh, FLS Energy Incorporated in 2006, uh, the cost of a solar panel, a solar module, was about three dollars and fifty cents a watt. And uh, today, you know, and, and this, this this graph goes through 2011. Today, we're buying solar panels at less than a dollar a watt, 85 cents a watt. It's going to go down to 65 cents a watt by the end of the the end of the year. Uh, so there's a, just an incredible amount of success in the industry. Certainly, we hope we can bring that success to, to the Anka School project. And then, lastly, just to give you a sense of what is going on in North Carolina, uh, five years ago there would have been no bubbles uh, on on the, the map of North Carolina. Now there's uh, incredible projects you know, from, from, from military to homeowners to businesses all over the state. And, and so our country is very much in a transition of getting energy from, from a, a wider variety of sources, coal, nuclear, uh, natural gas, propane, wind and solar are, are coming up and are, are very much now a part of, of how we meet our energy today. How's that? Time? You have one minute. <laughs> I have one minute, okay. So, so um, and I, I'm happy to answer any questions if you have them. The one minute there. The, the, just so I understand it, in looking at those, those dots, the, the, the numbers that are associated with water size are going to go up. That's right. Was there any work uh, done on putting solar panels on the Inca High School roof at all? Was there? So have you done any work at all on the high school? 
no, we don't. We do not even have a contract uh, signed with the, with the with the school system yet. So we haven't done any work. Uh, uh, although there's been planning work and and design work, but no physical work that we've done. Have we paid you anything? No. Uh, can Campbell answer a question about? Uh, we spent, I believe, it was fifty-six thousand dollars on this project, and plus all the the roofing that was done that was not in line to be done yet, but they had to do it for that. Do we have any legal recourse? Well, I would give attorney client advice to the board in closed session like we always do. We don't have attorney client advice in open session. So we'd be happy to address that to the board as we always do in closed session. Well, I think that uh, there's certainly, you know, there's other options that we can uh, pursue. Uh, we have not spent uh, the total amount that we had set aside for the uh, solar project because part of that was the uh, build phase of it. Um, Did we spend the $13,000 on the attorney's uh, pay for negotiating a contract? I don't know where the $13,000 came from, but you had to recall it. I think it was $13,000 in the budget for some engineering. Well, no, for the construction pretty... phase for uh, our architect to oversee yeah. the I saw that for the negotiation. There has been no $13,000. Well, I constantly ask you for a detailed, uh, itemized list of what we've paid you, and I have not received it. Ms. Lawson, on the board has not asked for a breakdown of this particular item. We have done some negotiations with SLS. We would be happy to talk to the board, but there was no $13,000 payment made. And uh, just to clarify, by now, the roof is already put down, and that's your potential issue anyway. So we did it a year ahead. It wasn't that we weren't going to do it. All right, How much did we pay Ledgerton Architecture to do this study? $116,000 to do a study. And they recommended we spend $8 million at Inca High School on putting in a whole entire new uh, HVAC system, tearing out the walls to put more pipes in instead of just buying a boiler, which is common sense. Uh, we can't afford to make $8 million in renovations there. And to put the rooftop solar on, and that was a profit-making enterprise by FLS. We weren't going to get anything out of it at all, hardly. We were going to get $4,100 a month out of this. And now we've spent, uh, you know, I said at least $116,000, and it was over $200,000 if you add in the roofing. I'm, I'm just incredulous. You know what's so funny is if we hadn't done that, you'd be sitting in the hospital. That's be, not true. I'm criticized. You'd be saying, why haven't we done the study? Why haven't we done the research? No, why I would never we... say that because I voted against we, everything. Okay. I voted against every phase of the We're study. There were three phases of this talk. study. No, you can't because I'm talking. Okay. Okay. The taxpayers deserve answers. All right. This is incredible. $116,000 down the drain plus those roofs. I want to see the work session is over. Thank you. Whoa. Tate just ran out. That was great. Action. Action. We love it. We love it. It's like watching professional wrestling. What's that? It's like watching wrestling. Yeah. 